The reaction has been surprisingly subdued in the streets of Amman. As Russia sees it, the world has only three options. Bosnian officials here say the UN effort, as it now stands, is of little use to them. Peace is not going to fall into the laps of the Somali people. Rwanda is here, they say, perched on the rocky hillsides of Zaire. In post-war Kuwait, there's a hand-and-glove relationship between defense and the economy. Stefan Kotsonis, CNN, Cairo. Jerusalem, Tbilisi. Vukovar. Baghdad. Mogadishu. Sarajevo. Federal forces today won the battle for the key city of Vukovar. Stefan Katsonis has more. Serbian and federal fighters are closing in on neighborhoods where exhausted Croatian soldiers are literally counting out the final hours of their lives. The Serbs are backed up by a huge outlay of artillery, tanks, and MiG jets. But the big guns have fallen ominously silent to allow their own men to move in and clean up the last Croatian resistance. That resistance has been reduced to deadly sniper fire, the odd grenade, and last stands of machine gun volleys. And those two cameras. For the first time, the Iraqi government has allowed CNN to film the UN monitoring system in one of its missiles components plants. Ten video cameras watch over the factory floor, while two photographic cameras watch the video cameras, making sure no one tampers with them. In effect, these are the UN inspectors and these are their guards. If the engineers change this part for a larger gauge, they can build the tubes for long-range scuds. But the UN will see. The cameras are now in place. It may have taken years of haggling and the Iraqi government may have agreed only grudgingly. But agree it did. And as far as it's concerned, it's time to start lifting the sanctions. There's a hint of hope in the morning air as 120 displaced families prepared to return to their villages. Since the civil war drove them from their homes, they've lived in hovels, in dirty camps by the roadside. We came here mainly because there was no food in our villages, she says. Amid the chaos of bags and bed frames, they gather up their belongings and their children for the journey home. Do you have Nurta's stuff, one calls out. I've got some, but I don't know if this is everything, the other shouts back. Hundreds of thousands of Somalis took refuge in the cities when armed bandits ran wild and starvation stalked the countryside. Now, aid groups and peacekeepers think it's safe for them to go back. Italian forces lead them on a five-hour convoy home. As their journey ends, people from the neighboring village race to the roadside to welcome them home. Back in their village, there are countless happy reunions. <laughs> Only those too old, too feeble, or too stubborn to leave had stayed behind. How we suffered, she says. They had their share of stories to tell, of attacks by looters, of those who didn't survive the war. On a field outside Pretoria, designers from the LIW Corporation show off their hardware. They are proud to say their G5 and G6 cannon are among the world's deadliest, and they can be bought at a very good price. It's good at conventional warfare, uh, also for fast uh, tactical uh, uh, strategic movement that you need it for. For 17 years, the United Nations punished South Africa's racist regime by imposing an arms embargo. Ironically, the embargo had an unintended effect. The old regime had wars to fight. What they couldn't buy, they learned to build for themselves. 
Until the embargo was lifted, these factories were state secrets. The South African arms industry once operated in a twilight world of secret transshipments, sanctions busting, and selling guns to one's enemies' enemies. Now they are not only shedding that cloak and dagger image, they are throwing their doors open, promoting themselves aggressively in the world's arms market. Among the modern office blocks and fuel-injected traffic jams, an ancient tradition, the Arab headdress, persists. It is called the kufiya, or hatta. The rope that adorns the kufiya and holds it in place is called the agal. It is warmth against the winter cold, shade against the sun, and a shield against the enemy. It is worn by kings and paupers alike. For expert advice on the ways and meanings of the Arab Hatta, the man to see is Abu Sayel. The kafia reflects the mood of the man, he says. If you are sad or mourning the death of a loved one, it is wrapped around to hide the sorrow on the face. But one flap is left to hang, because during the wake, many relatives and friends will come to kiss you on the cheek. If you're still young and want to look cool, pile it high and tilt it to the side. Abu Sayel says in the bad old days, the single flap was also a sign of danger. It meant you were taking up your rifle to fight an enemy, to raid another village, or to settle a score with an ornery neighbor. But he is a more peaceful man nowadays. He's more interested in tending his fields. Now this is how you wear it while farming. And he doesn't give a hoot who thinks he looks silly. Stefan Kotsonis, CNN, Fahes. At first, the riot police held back. Then they moved in. They forced the demonstrators back, firing tear gas and rubber bullets into the university grounds. The protesters responded with stones. But most of those that were fired on were innocent bystanders, students and teachers on their way to class. Why our government do this for us? We are just pupils here. We don't... Most of them had nothing to do with that. For the activists in this crowd, today is a turning point. They say even if Israel closed down the settlements tomorrow, they want more. Full withdrawal from all occupied Arab lands. Mr. De Klerk,